Welcome, Martin. Please tell us a bit about yourself and your interest in longevity. Hello, uh, my name is Martin Liposhek. I'm from Slovenia. At the moment, I'm a PhD student. I'm doing um, a PhD from philosophy, and my uh, philosophy thesis is focusing on life extension or longevity. So, in details, I'm applying phenomenology and existentialism as a school of thought to the questions uh, in life extension and longevity. <laughs> Interesting. And how would you characterize the outlooks of phenomenology and existentialism on longevity? Obviously, there could be different thinkers within those paradigms of thought who could have different views, but what is your overall impression? Yeah, my impression is, the main is that life extension is actually under-researched. We have very small number of philosophers who actually research this new field, which I believe is really important because so big changes in the way how we live are actually opening up new perspective, new perspectives, new way of thinking about ourselves and about the world, um, new explanations of ourselves, and this is completely a new field that is really not studied enough. Yes, I completely agree that it is insufficiently studied. Are there any philosophers, either historical or contemporary, that you think have done a good job covering the prospect of radical life extension? Yeah, we have uh, some contemporary philosophers, I mean, who are now working now, and they are also, uh, uh, some of them participating in our longevity movement. But historically, philosophers, I would say that unfortunately, most of them, you have some very small number of exceptions, but most of them are accepting view in, uh, are accepting uh, this view that death is not a good thing. Um, and one explanation is a simply rationalization, you know, to actually help humanity deal with death with such a way that you say it's something good for you and then you don't care so much and you're happy about it. Yes, it seems that a lot of historical philosophy has served the purpose of providing consolation rather than solutions. But there have been some, I think, quite good thinkers historically who rejected death. And one of them was the Marquis de Condorcet, for instance, who unfortunately died in prison during the French Revolution, but he wrote his... Uh, history uh, and the future progress of mankind, where he posited that essentially mortality from old age could one day be overcome, and Benjamin Franklin is another example. But you're correct that historically, because mortality was inevitable for the vast majority of our existence, I think philosophers tried their best to find ways to make peace with it rather than to fight it. Yeah, mostly. I mean, there are exceptions, but the, you know, the, the we can start from Socrates, who said that you know um, he is looking forward to the next world where he will continue speaking philosophy. So death is just you know travel and so on. And then you have different other philosophies. But um, yeah, there are exceptions. Even the, some famous one, for example, um, you can find even some sentences in René Descartes, who said uh, that science will actually also help us um, deal with the problems of aging and so on. So, there are exceptions, um, but ma mainstream is... I, I hope that now, since we see that um, aging can be addressed, that I'm hoping that the mainstream will also change. Yes, and it's interesting how philosophy can itself evolve and respond to changes in technology. So while many philosophers would consider their work to be fundamental in terms of describing the nature of reality or man's place in reality, so to speak, in truth, that understanding itself evolves based on what is possible and what is widely recognized as being possible. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, philosophy is actually really uh, this kind of um, how can I say, spiritual work that is 
connected with the whole um, sphere of humanity, of human beings. So it goes in both directions. For example, science inspires philosophy and philosophy uh, inspires science. And through the history, it went in both directions uh, many times. Uh, yes. There are certainly feedback loops yes. involved. So would the public be able to read some of your research at some point in time, say, uh, when you finish your PhD? Yes, in around two years, uh, fin PhD will be finished, and I'm also happy to do it, uh, I plan to do it also in English. I mean, the final thesis will be in Slovene language, but I plan to do like a short book or bigger book also in English language uh, to share my um, findings. Wonderful, so we shall be looking forward to that. Yeah, and, and I have one more thing to say. Yes. So I'm also uh, leading uh, Society for Vital Life Extension of Slovenia, which is NGO mm -hmm. who promotes longevity in Slovenia. And we are organizing uh, a conference on healthy um, aging. Um, this will be on 10th of October uh, in Ljubljana. So everyone who is in this kind of uh, this region of Europe is welcome in, the, in person. And we also have a Zoom or a YouTube stream, so feel free to connect us and watch the conference. So this will be on October 10th yes. in Ljubljana, which is the capital of Slovenia. There will be an online option for anyone who is willing to join. I think this yes. is a great idea to spread awareness of longevity science and of course the philosophical and advocacy dimensions of it as well. So I wish you all the best Thank with you. that conference. I'm also curious what your impressions have been of Longevity Summit Dublin so far. This yeah. has been the third day of it. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, lectures are very high quality and we hear some really groundbreaking new stuff. And also the people here are just fantastic. I mean, it's like meeting old friends, you know, that you didn't know before. So it's really fantastic. Yes, indeed. And we are all friends here because we share a common yes. purpose, a goal to uplift humanity and uplift ourselves in the process. So yes. thank you very much, Martin, thank for you. joining us today. It was great speaking with you.